You're listening to the Old Time Radio Show on 71K News Talk Radio. Now back to Denver's Old Time Radio History buff, John Dunning. And it is a great pleasure to have Elliot Lewis, who did just about anything you can do in radio, was uh, Frankie Remley on the Phil Harris Alice Faye Show. Uh, directed that series in uh, at least in its last years. We'll talk about that. Starred in many suspense broadcasts, played uh, bit parts in others, uh, directed the show through for a couple of years in the early 50s, during uh, during which it uh, did some very interesting things. Was responsible in no small part for such notable shows as Broadway is My Beat, Crime Classics. Uh, pursuit the lineup and uh, I I won't even name them all and is now in Hollywood uh, or in California writing a series of mystery novels uh, about a uh, detective named Bennett I guess it's a detective I have to um, I've got the books on order and I haven't been able to get them yet are you there I'm here John how are you I'm just great that sounds just like Frankie Remley on the phone <laughs> who what what kind of a character is Bennett Bennett is an ex-cop. He got thrown off the force. And uh, he works. He solves mysteries, but not as successfully as your people. Because I haven't gotten nominated. Well, I, I'm always a nominee and never a winner. You know that? Oh, you said you had two nominations. <laughs> I had two nominations and two losses. Well, that's two ahead of me. Uh, Bennett's World is the new one, right? Bennett's World is the new one, yeah. And then ahead of that, there were four... Uh, uh, Bennett's that have numbers on them. Bennett one, Bennett two. It's a series for Pinnacle. Altogether, uh, if I finish all I'm supposed to finish, there will be uh, twelve or thirteen books. When did you dis when did you start doing these? Uh, the Bennett books. Yeah. I started writing them about uh, I guess three or four years ago. I was working with uh, E. Jack Newman on some stuff over at Paramount television stuff and I had done a, a screenplay teleplay using the Bennett character and uh, NBC I think it was somebody one of the uh, networks had optioned it and while it was sitting there another piece of material uh, that I had written uh, as a suspense mystery story as a novel had been making the rounds of publishers and uh, we got a note from one of the publishers saying we like the way he writes but uh, we, we're not looking for this can he do a series and the day my agent called me about that I was having lunch with E. Jack and I repeated this to him and he said why don't you make a novel out of that screenplay mm -hmm. so that's what started it and they uh, they bought it the people who liked the idea and wanted the series didn't buy it <laughs> well, but Pinnacle did and, and made the deal, and I've been working on it ever since. I think probably both of us know how publishers are in that. Uh, I'm, I'm just beginning to my horror to find out. You couldn't find the books, huh? Indiver. Well, uh, I can't even find my own books half the time. I know. I looked for a, a deadline the other day and couldn't find it. Here in Los Angeles. Yeah, it, it you know they they publish these things and then they just kind of die on you. And uh, when you try to to get them through the bookstores, it, it takes six weeks minimum if you can do that. You know? Yeah. So I'm I I wanted to read them before you got on, but I don't even have them yet. And I I wanted to ask you what kind of a character is Bennett? Well, I I don't know how to describe it. I I recall once reading that a novelist uh, said that after he turned in his book, if somebody told him it was the worst piece of junk they ever read in his life, he'd agree with them. And if they said it was the best piece of junk they ever read in their life, he'd agree with them, because at that point he had no idea what how it was going or what it was about, or <clears throat> pardon me, yeah. if it was successful or how the characters related. Bennett is, is a Vietnam War veteran who has been, uh, as I say, who resigned from the force before being thrown off of it for something that he didn't do, but had too much honor uh, to tell people what really happened. Mm -hmm. uh, his wife can't stand being married to a policeman. She's a nice lady, but very spoiled, and uh, she divorces him. And when we pick him up in book one, 
which was written three or four years ago, as I say, uh, he gets an assignment to help the department that he used to be a part of from his ex-commanding officer in the department, a captain of homicide, Rufus Drang, and that becomes the first case. Now, the book that's just out, they asked me then to do a, a longer book. These uh, numbered books run around 200 pages. Mm -hmm. The longer one runs, I think, 310 or something like that. Isn't that about what they run? Uh, yeah, I, I, that's normally what the... Um... Yeah, so that's what that one runs. And I decided I would do the case that... that lost him his wife and got him thrown off the force. So that's what Bennett's world is. Uh, do you consider yourself now primarily a writer or, or an actor? Well, I never thought of myself as an actor. The first thing I ever bought for myself and the first thing I ever started working on was uh, writing. I had always done that. Acting was something that, that uh, was easy for me to do, radio acting anyway. And so I kind of fell into it and uh, made some money that way. Hmm. But I'd always thought of myself as a writer and a director. Acting was something separate, and, and producing was simply a way of uh, of controlling all the elements. You know. As I go back in, into what I know about your career, and instead of starting at the beginning, going back from now, we look back about um, nine years ago, and you were... Uh, directing and producing a series called the Zero Hour, which was syndicated. Yeah, radio show. And uh, I listened to some of those sh the tapes of that show, and, uh, you know, you guys did just about everything you could possibly do. You had uh, top-line talent, good writing, solid stories. Mm -hmm. Why didn't it work? In the sense that... They couldn't sell it. That's what I mean. Do you, do you have a, a theory about why radio today will, will not go on stations uh, anymore? Yeah, I think there's no advertiser, no national advertiser support. We just finished this, as you know, we did, uh, incidentally, I was listening to your on the air thing, and I heard Fletcher, uh, giving the closing credits. Was that a Studio One? Yes. Because Fletcher was my, my partner, right hand, the general assistant in, uh, the Sears Radio Theater and Mutual Radio Theater that we just completed. And we ran into the same problems there. We just completed doing 235 original hours on the CBS radio network. That <laughs> was uh, the Sears show. Mutual picked up the second year, and they had to give it up because where stations would be able to sell to national sponsors, for example, KNX here is a CBS station and yet carried... Uh, the Mutual Radio Theater, including the title Mutual Radio Theater. Locally, George Nikolov, KNX, was able to sell the time uh, allotments, uh, local time allotments, to national sponsors. Uh, if I can name a few of them, Lufthansa, sure. General Motors, Wall Street Journal, were buying local spots on KNX, and yet national sponsors were not supporting the shows. And the same thing was uh, true of Zero Hour. In the case of Zero Hour, however, it started out as a syndicated show. When it moved over to the network, I was no longer with it. Uh, I did, I don't remember how many weeks or how many shows we did. But those shows were syndicated. Uh, as I say, and you said, we had big stars. We, we would have three or four or five stars on a show coming in to do uh, two or three hours work on each half hour. I think one of the reasons it was difficult to sell, aside from national sponsor interest, is that in trying to do the dramatization of a novel into five half hours, made it necessary to sell, for the station to play all five half hours and to play them in sequence, play them in order. Mm -hmm. And I think... It, it, you really are disturbing uh, a pattern that the station has. You, I gather, are now on a station, that, the broadcast we're doing right at this moment. Mm -hmm. is, that, is this on a station that is largely talk? Yes. So once a station is patterned, I think they kind of stay that way and they don't like to make changes. Although uh, KNX here, which is an all-news station, 
carried uh, Sears Radio Theater and carried uh, uh, Mutual Radio Theater and carried High Brown Show, the uh, CBS Mystery Theater. Mystery Theater, yeah. right. So I don't know. I think it's national sponsor interest from what I can gather from friends uh, who were in the agency business. The national sponsors... I don't know. I guess they just don't believe there's an audience. We found quite the opposite. We found that there was an enormous audience and a, and a, a great audience of young people who were, were learning how to listen. Boy, that's sure true. I'll tell you, they, they, I, you find a whole generation that doesn't, isn't able to concentrate on these things. Well, I was talking to, to a man the other day who's, who was National Public Radio who said exactly what you just said. He said all of the research that they have done uh, leads them to believe that the attention span of the modern audience is a very, very short span. An hour show they found won't work at all. They can barely get by with a half hour. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. I read some, some research material which indicated that uh, people who had watched television a great deal of the time uh, didn't know what they were watching. They tried it. No, this is real. No, I believe it. They tried experiments where they would take the third scene and put it where the eighth scene was and the sixth scene where the second scene was and so on, and that, uh, people watching it didn't react at all. They couldn't tell the difference. They weren't following the story. Right. They were looking at flickering images. Hmm. And radio demands that you pay attention. You must listen. It's very rewarding because once you become involved, uh, there you are. I think, do you agree that that uh, probably the largest radio audience would be today would be people who are readers, who read books or magazines, newspapers? The largest radio audience? I mean, if, if you were looking for people who would be most likely to listen to radio drama. Oh, radio drama. Yeah. Yeah, I thought you were saying something else when you said the largest no. radio audience. No, no. Yeah. no. Who would listen to uh, radio drama would be people who, who were readers. Sure. Uh, but you're talking about 5% of the population there. Yeah, I know, but 5% of how many million people live in this country? That's a pretty big audience for not very much money. I know. Uh, that's paying attention. The, 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 the big thing about it, you know. The trouble that you have, I think, when you start dealing with individual radio stations is that nobody wants to go after 5% of the market. Yeah. That's, uh, that's well, sad. But <laughs> and yet there will, they are beginning to support cable, which is a small percentage of the market. Yeah. It is just two minutes after four at KNUS in Denver. And uh, you're listening to Old Time Radio, which is brought to you by the Public Service Company, and I'm talking to Elliot Lewis, and we're talking about, uh, well, we're talking about the zero hour right now and why shows like that can't work. I think that uh, you, you really hit a, a good, valid point on zero hour when you said, uh, uh, when you talked about not wanting to break the format, because even, even uh, stations where CBS Mystery Theater is running, they always want the option to preempt it in, in the case of a basketball game or something like that. Well, we have that also with Sears and with Mutual. Uh, many preemptions. Uh, KMX would take, if we were preempted for a ball game on a Monday night, they play it on Saturday, Monday show. Now, we were structured to be uh, uh, have a different type of show with a different host each night of the week. Monday we did... Uh, uh, Western Americana stuff with Lauren Green. Tuesday we did comedy with uh, Andy Griffith. Wednesday mysteries with Vincent Price. Thursday romantic uh, people stories with Cicely Tyson. And Friday uh, adventure science fiction stuff with first Whitmark, then Duff, uh, and then Leonard Nimoy. Now, we thought this was a pretty good pattern. But Nick Law didn't have any trouble when he moved it around. But but he wasn't. He didn't have to worry about a continuing story. Mm -hmm. However, we couldn't do because of that and tune in tomorrow night for it because we didn't know what they would play tomorrow night. Yeah. You know. So it just didn't. Uh, it's very hard to break into it. But I think the big thing is the attention span that you were talking about. I I really. Mm -hmm. I think once. 
once an audience starts to listen to radio drama, they will listen and they will pay attention. It would be very hard to turn off sorry, wrong number mm -hmm. once you got hooked. You know? oh, oh, listen, I can think of uh, I can think of a thousand shows that would be difficult to turn off. Oh, sure. Um, uh, is that series still available to uh, stations who um, who want to air it? And can they can they write somewhere and get it? I have no idea. Or that they they just lay in there somewhere collecting dust. I have no dust. idea. I don't know where the masters are. What happened to them? The zero hour shows were put together by a man named Jay Kolos, K H O L O S, who had an advertising agency here in uh, Los Angeles, and he thought that it was the time for radio, and he put this thing together. All I did was was uh, produce and direct it and edit it, and, you know, all of that stuff uh, for him. We came up with um, with a series of uh, of actual syndication masters here in Denver about a week ago. A listener called and was kind enough to say that uh, he he had some and and would loan them to us. And they still had the the Colas uh, Production Company sticker on them, and I, it, but there was nowhere on there that indicated anything about uh, well, if this show doesn't make it, we'll still keep it available. I don't know. I haven't heard of it in years. I have no idea. I would imagine if anyone was interested, uh, they could look in an L.A. phone book and see if Colos or his advertising agency uh, is listed and, and call and find out. But he, he was the last person I know of that would have had anything to do with it. As I say, they did some further shows after I left. Uh, what we came up with was 11 shows. And I don't know whether that's all the ones that... I think that's all I did. Yeah. Are they are they continuing stories? Oh yes, yes, well, they're all there. Uh, there are eleven five chapter shows. I think there's one one chapter show in there, isn't there, Jerry? Uh, oh, you haven't seen them yet. Uh, but uh, yeah, they're all there, I believe. Oh, after I left, John, uh, he decided he'd do a, ch a show less expensively, and I think he did it for Mutual. Uh, a half hour show using old. Uh, who remember it from what series, mystery type shows, that he had a staff of three writers rewrite. Mm -hmm. And they would do a half hour show a day that was complete in itself. But they broke for so many commercials that they, I think one of the writers told me they had like 17 minutes left of drama while the rest of it was commercial time. Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult to, to sustain getting back to attention span to sustain audience interest when uh, as you get to the high spot of the scene and the scene has only run three minutes you then do four minutes of commercial yeah yeah that's well, easy. that to me ultimately is the answer when somebody comes up and says, uh, do you ever think radio will come back even remotely like it was? It can't under that kind of a, of a system, can it? No, I wouldn't think so. I think the only way it can come back is if somebody gives it a chance to come back. The problem we had on both Sears and Mutual and Zero Hour is that people seem to have forgotten that things have to be sold. It's, it would be very difficult for you to sell me something I've never heard of and didn't know existed. And once I heard of it and found out it existed, didn't know what it was. Mm -hmm. uh, and this was true uh, to some degree of the Zero Hour show, and it was certainly true of both Sears Radio Theater and Mutual Radio Theater. Everybody had good intentions, but they sat in their offices waiting for somebody to, to call them up and buy the show. And uh, I don't think that's the way that you run the railroad. No. You, know, you got to let it let people know it's out there. The audience reaction was marvelous. People would pick it up and they'd listen to it. And as I say, mostly young audience. You talk about expense. You had uh, you talk about talent. Rod Serling was the announcer. The music uh, Ferranti and Teicher did the theme, and you right. had you had stars every week like Howard Duff, Edgar Bergen did one. I remember. Yeah. Um, the Astons, Patty Duke Aston and John Aston were in one. They did the opening show. Whatever happened to Susan Oliver, one of my favorite actresses? She was a star on one of the shows with John yeah. Daner. I don't know. I haven't seen Susie in a couple of years. She just dropped out of television. Well, I think, you know, she was a great flyer, among other things. Uh, piloted her own plane. Is a, is a great glider pilot. Uh, she may have gone into something else entirely. I, I never had the feeling that she was that interested in, in acting. She's a good actress and a beautiful woman. Back in the 60s, you, you, you could literally not turn on your television 
without seeing the kind of folks you had on Zero Hour. Niemeyer Persoff, Susan Oliver, um, who was the other one that uh, that came to my mind? I, I've spaced it now, but uh, uh, Real Dick Crenna, you had him? Yeah. Uh, those folks were on all the time. Right. Johnny Daner. John Daner. Well, yeah, of course. It seemed like what you would, what you did with the Zero Hour was that you were using top-line uh, television talent for the leads, right? They wanted as much name value as was possible uh, in order to help us fail. But then when we did get the people, they didn't do too much about publicizing it. Mm -hmm. Once again, you have the sales thing. But, you know, radio is funny. I was glancing through your, your book about radio. At some of the old older shows uh, where they used Hollywood names, and for the most part, uh, the fact that the names were there didn't help them very much. Listening to, to Patty and John Aston do a radio show, they both are, are marvelous actors. But when you're listening, if you miss the opening credits, you don't know it's Patty and John Aston. That's right. Uh, we were talking the other day uh, about a show that Lucille Ball had done in radio. And the point was brought up that in the radio days, who was a bigger star, Lucille Ball or the Lone Ranger? <laughs> you know? Because in radio, it really doesn't matter. Uh, you hear the voice, and part of the magic of uh, the, the, uh, the radio drama is that you're going to, you, the audience, are going to construct your own hero, your own villain from the voice, from the lines, from the clues and hints you're given by sound effects and music and everything else. That's right. So that it was it was very nice having all of those names on Zero Hour and we had names on uh, Sears and on Mutual. But the only purpose for them would be to get space in the in the print mm -hmm. uh, and for advertising purposes because once the audience gets into it if you didn't hear well you can't use Duff because the, the voice is so familiar sure. but if uh, they use Patty and John again if you missed the opening credits and you just heard these two marvelous performances you're just interested in the performances right and you have no idea though, who the people are, and you listen at the end if, if you're curious, you know. I think uh, the one that Susan Oliver was in was a, is a good example. I mean, like I say, I really liked her as an actress, but I wouldn't have known her from from uh, Eve on the radio. But yet I knew John Daner. I mean, you can well, you never mistake. from the radio there. Sure. You know, incidentally, I was glancing through your book, and you had a thing about uh, uh, the Hermit's Cave. Yeah. Wasn't John the Hermit? John Daner? Yeah. <laughs> I, I'd never heard that one. I, Bill Conrad was the producer. Right. We did a KMPC, and I wrote a script for it called, uh, I don't remember what it was called. I wrote the script and I starred in it. And I'm positive that John Daner was a hermit. Because I remember sitting in the rehearsal and John was doing some jokes at the piano. He's a funny, funny mm. man. And he was doing a routine, some kind of thing, and that was where, where it was. And I was going to add, I made a note to myself to ask you that question. Well, you know, I'll tell you, just, just since it came up, um, the book, uh, the way the book was put together, a lot of it was done from the press that came out at the time. I, I collected something like seven or 8,000 magazine articles on it. And, and uh, the particular, I forget even the guy's name that I, I cited as the hermit in that show, but uh, that came from Radio Life. They went out and interviewed the guy, I think, and he, he mentioned being a hermit. But like many other roles, it may have been done uh, by more than one person. Oh, sure. Once again, we get to the radio performer. You know, if you're, uh, the business of <laughs> how important the actor is is that the next week somebody else comes in, nobody knows the difference. <laughs> yeah. Um, again, we're talking to Elliot Lewis about uh, the, the great days. The first time I ever talked to you on the phone, I said the, the, the old days, and you said, my gosh, don't call them the old days. Oh, no. Uh, I'll give you a real stock question. How did you get started? I was at Los Angeles City College uh, studying almost anything, trying to figure out what it was I wanted to do. And 
And I had done, in high school in the East, where I was born and raised, I had done some uh, acting in the school plays. And so when I came out here, uh, there was an audition for a radio acting class. And since I had an opening in my schedule, I took the audition. I, I got into the radio acting class. And a graduate of Los Angeles City College, a man named True Boardman, was then producing and directing and writing at KHJ downtown in Los Angeles at 7th and Bixel up above the Cadillac store, and which was the Don Lee Network out here. And True came back to the school to talk to the radio class and invite them to come down and audition for him for a job in radio. And I wasn't in class that day. And I heard about it. Uh, I wasn't cutting. I think I was ill. I heard about it later in the week, and I called him, and he said, well, no, you come down, too. And I went down, and he gave me a job. Hmm. And so I started working down there. And I did, uh, got in the serial. Uh, I don't remember the name. But then they were doing a series of shows out here that called Calling All Cars, mm -hmm. police story. Sure. William and Robson did that, didn't he? Robson did it, and then Sam Pierce did it. And then, so I did it, because we were working right next door to, we, to where I was working on the uh, on this serial that I was on for Young and Rubicum, and uh, that Harry Ackerman was producing and directing, and Ted Bliss produced and directed some of them. And Robeson happened to wander by, and he heard me, and he asked me if I want to work on Calling All Cars, and I got him Calling All Cars. And the Young and Rubicum people got into national radio at that time with a show called Silver Theater. And since I had been working for them, uh, they asked me to come over and uh, play a part on Silver Theater. So I started working on that show, and that led to other shows. And, uh, I was living in a rooming house near the university, the college, and in the next room was my music professor, who stopped me at breakfast one day and said, you know, you've been working and you haven't been to class in two months, so I think it'd be a nice idea if you've got a withdrawal in case you ever want to go back to college, you'd be able to get in, otherwise you're going to flunk everything because you haven't been there. So I withdrew from City College and I went to work as an actor who was also writing. I was writing for The Whistler and, as I say, the Herman's Cave and doing things like that. I wrote a couple of spots for a, a show that Sam Pierce was doing at KHJ for Ukulele Ike. Remember? Oh, yeah. Gus Edwards. Yeah. And then Benny Rubin had a show of his own down there and he asked me to work with him on the show. So I was doing a lot of acting and uh, quite a bit of writing, but more and more acting. Then in uh, the war came along and Tom Lewis, who had been head of the West Coast office of Young and Rubicum, uh, no relation, Tom started up the Armed Forces Radio Service and he prevailed upon the service to take me out of the quartermaster corps where I had been drafted. Don't ask me why. And come to work for him in charge of what we call denatured commercials. And I did three and a half years of service inventing new ways to record and re-record radio programs. And my little group of seven other guys we're doing 120 radio shows a week. Wow. We would take them off the air and take out anything that dated them or was commercial or censorable, reassemble them and ship them hmm. to, I think we had 496 stations around the world. So when I came back after the war, it was very hard to get started again. And an old friend, Ozzy Nelson, uh, called me and gave me a job on his show as an actor and I started working again and what did you do for him? I did mean, odd parts. 
Hard part? Yeah. No, never did a steady part. My wife was steady on the show, played Clara. This is Kathy Nelson. I mean, Kathy uh, Lewis. No, no, this is Mary Jane. Oh, Mary Jane. Yeah. No, no. Uh, Mary Jane and I have been married 23 years. Mm -hmm. Kathy Lewis and I were divorced uh, just after On Stage went off the air, and then she died a couple years after that. Well, when you said your wife about that time, I figured it was must have been her because we're talking about now about 1944, 44, somewhere along that. Yeah, no, Kathy was my wife at the time. My wife now, Mary Jane Croft. Yeah, was uh, Clara, and then went into television. You said on the phone the other day. I think I think I got the figure. I may have gotten the figure wrong, but uh, you said that you once did twenty some odd shows in one day. In one week. One week. Yeah. I don't know how it happened. I think uh, the, the, it was 20 shows because everything was live and I was including repeats. I know one Wednesday that I've never forgotten, I was on the, uh, I did six shows, three shows and three repeats. Somehow or other, in one day, I did, Fred Allen was out here, I did the Fred Allen show and the Fred Allen repeat. Dr. Christian and the Dr. Christian repeat and something else or that was all on the same day and that repeat a big town I think it was and a big town repeat so that because of the time differential you, you went on the air with the early with the New York show oh three thirty or 4 o'clock on some of them and we were still broadcasting at 10 o'clock that night you know running back and forth hmm you never did, Frank. The, the Frankie Remley was never on Jack Benny. As no, a... Remley was never on the Benny show. They only talked about it. And that gave uh, Phil the idea when he did his own show with Alice that they'd have Remley do it. There were, as you know, and, uh, there was a real Remley. And uh, you could hear him laughing on, on the <laughs> Benny show. Had a, a very infectious laugh. And Jack would always do jokes about uh, what a bum Remley was. You know, he was always stoned. And, you know, all of the lousy musician jokes. And so Phil tried it, and he tried it. The opening show, as I, as I remember it, was with Remley. Oh, yes. And they just didn't like the way it went. At that time, I was doing a show on Sundays over uh, at Mutual with Harry Einstein at Park Your Carcass. Right. And I would go from there and over to NBC. I don't remember what the other show was. To do something else. At all events, I showed up after the first Harris show to do the other show that I was supposed to be doing that day at NBC. And Phil and Alice and Frankie were talking about the funny show, and I asked how it went, and Phil said, I want to talk to you about it. And... Uh, we went inside and had a cup of coffee together, and he said, Remley doesn't want to do it, and he's, he just doesn't read it right. It's not funny the way he does it. We were talking about, we're going to try it one more week. Would you give it a try next week? And I said, yes, and we did nine years. It just worked beautifully, you know. Except uh, right around 1951 or 52, you suddenly became Elliot Lewis on that show. I think Phil and Remley got into a beef uh -huh. about... Uh, the use of the name. You're listening to the Old Time Radio Show on 71K News Talk Radio. Now back to Denver's Old Time Radio History buff, John Dunning. Hmm. And I think, I'm not sure of this, I think there was a money thing involved or something. The feeling I got was that people other than Phil and Frankie uh, sat down and started arguing about whether... Phil should be paying Remley for the use of his name, although I was doing it. Hmm. I don't think Remley was a part of it, and I don't think Phil was a part of it. But the result of it was that Phil got mad and said, to hell with it, we'll call you by your right name. Hmm. Which seemed wrong if, if it wasn't as funny. Elliot's not funny, Frankie's funny. <laughs> it uh, it didn't really affect the uh, the performance of the show, though. I mean, the writing no, still... No, the same thing that they sure. did. But it's, it's for Phil to say Elliot is not as funny as for Phil to say Frankie, you know. I don't know why, but... <laughs> you know, Fred Allen has, uh, has something in one of his books about 
about words that are funny and names that are funny. And you know, there is some truth in that. So there are some names and some words that just are inherently funnier than others. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, if, if uh, well, the example of that my name is not funny. Remley is funny. Hmm. Elliot Lewis does it sound very funny. Yeah. But you get a picture when you say Frankie Remley. Whether or not you had ever heard him. I think the the reason that Jack Benny used the name so much is because it, it, it sounded funny. Yeah. You know, when he said Remley. He was the nicest man. Jack Benny? Oh, yeah, and Remley, too. I mean. yeah. You know, Remley was left-handed, and I'm left-handed. And Remley played guitar left-handed. In other words, he strung it up upside down. So that one of the jokes we wanted to do one week worked out pretty good because they wanted me to walk out on the stage with the guitar. And they were doing... This may have been the first one I did. It, it was the story of how Phil met Remley. And so what happened was that there's this bum on a street in New Orleans or somewhere playing and singing, playing his guitar and singing, You Are My Sunshine. And the joke is when you hear the coin drop in the tin cup, and Remley stops singing and says, thank you, sir. <laughs> so I had to learn how to play three chords on the guitar, and Remley taught me how to do it. Fortunately, I could use his spare guitar, because we were both left-handed. But he had it, <laughs> it was a six-string guitar. Yeah, I remember he had to take two strings off, because I couldn't even handle it with four. <laughs> You know, at six, it was impossible. I didn't seem to have enough fingers to go around. But it got such a yell. <laughs> you know, just hearing that is, is an enriching kind of thing, to know that Remley had that much of a hand in it, and the actual Remley did. Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Do you still see Phil Harris? I haven't seen Phil in... I don't know, I'm very bad on time. Oh. I could say, I, I, it seems to me when I see somebody that I just saw them three or four days ago, and it turns out it was 15 years ago, you know. Uh, so I really don't know. It seems to me I saw Phil four or five years ago, and I talked to Alice on the phone a couple of two, three years ago about something. I think I had a, yeah, we had a script uh, on uh, a mutual radio theater I thought she might want to do, and she was interested in it, but she was going out on the road with a show, and she wasn't available. But I, the last time I saw Phil, whenever it was, it's some years, we had breakfast together and uh, kind of chatted, and he had an idea of something he wanted to do that sounded just marvelous, which would have involved all of us making our living by sailing, hmm. <laughs> sailing around the world for nothing hmm. on, on a luxury liner. I don't know where he cut that. That is that is a pretty nice way to live. Well, he thinks of things like that. He, first cabin has always been Phil's idea, the way to go, and I agree with him. Uh, he, of course, uh, learned an awful lot about comedy from Jack Benny, didn't he? Oh, yeah. Jack was the best teacher in the world. I remember I was still in school the first time I worked for Jack at, because the Benny show was for uh, Young and Rubicum had the account. And we broadcast from what is now KHJ Mutual on Melrose Avenue right next to the Paramount Studios. At that time, that was where the NBC shows came from. NBC had not yet built the, the big building now torn down at the corner of uh, <coughs> Sunset and Vine. And I got a job on a Benny show. I had three or four lines. I think the sketch was, yes, it was, the sketch was that Benny was moving, right, from that studio up to the new studio. And in the script were two moving men named Mervyn and Laverne. And I was to be one of the moving men, a big dummy kind of a guy. And uh, Bill Morrow, the writer of the show, played the other moving man. And it really went very, very well. I was very pleased and, of course, honored to be there. And Jack was very, very sweet to me, and he wrote me a note. And he sent me an extra check. And he said, you got to laugh. I don't remember what the line was. And I didn't think that you would. And 
so this is because you were you did such a nice job. Thank you, and we'll mm -hmm. see you soon. And from that day on, uh, I did three or four Benny shows every year. Uh, at the Christmas shopping thing, I was a character, the same the same big jerk that Jack called the Mully. Mm -hmm. And I, well, I don't know what it meant or how it was spelled or... But anyway, that was his name. He, he would say, you do the mully this week. And then we would do the, one of the other appearances would be the uh, song thing. The first one of those, uh, remember when they would all go down to the railroad station, Mel Blank would call the oh, train, Kukamonga, sure. yeah. right. that thing. Uh, they would always work into that the people lined up waiting to get their tickets and of course something would happen to Jack Sheldon Leonard would try to uh, tout him onto something and one year they worked out a thing and I was standing in front of Jack in line and Frank Nelson was the uh, ticket agent and this is a good story also about how it was to work with a man like Jack the routine went uh, Jack is trying to get his ticket, and I'm in front of him. And Frank Nelson says to me, can I help you, sir? And I say, uh, does this train go to Glockamora? And Frank says, yeah. And I say, how are things at Glockamora? And he says, fine. And I say, is the little brook still rippling there? And we go on, we do the song that way. Well, just before broadcast, Jack came over to me and he said, I, I don't think we can do it that way. I think I'm, I'm scared. I don't know if anybody's going to laugh. So I said, we'll do it any way you want. And he said, well, let's think about it. And then he kind of paced around and he said, no, we've gone this far. And we all thought it was funny. And we decided that's the way to do it. And that's the way we're going to do it. And I did about four lines before anything happened, and then the audience realized what was what was happening, and they started laughing. Mm. So that each year, I would be on the Benny Show at about that time of the year also, and we would do those song things. I remember we did the Tennessee Waltz one mm -hmm. year, too. You know, that is a very memorable show, and Frank Nelson, in fact, cited that as one of his uh, most vivid memories of the Benny program. The Glockamore? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. it was hysterical. Very. Because by the time you get into the middle of it it is so ridiculous and of course it helps tremendously that Jack Benny is standing there holding his elbow as he did looking impatient and disgusted you know and Frank no matter what question I ask Frank is going fine yes you know funny routine but you know it seemed that when the, when Phil Harris started his own show he took what what Jack Benny did, and he even, if anything, even accelerated it because it came off. Uh, Frankie Remley, to me, as I listen to those old shows, is the epitome of sarcasm of ra on radio. Yeah. I mean, uh, that is probably the most vivid example of sarcastic humor I think I've ever heard. That show. Yeah. And uh, it seemed like he learned that from Benny, but but a lot of it was with the writers, Ray Singer and uh, Dick Chevalier, right? Oh yes, they wrote brilliant scripts. Just yeah. brilliant script. I remember the character was so firmly implanted that they did a whole script to get one line in. The script was Alice telling Phil that Remley was no good, that Remley was taking advantage of him, that Remley was using him, and that he should wise up and not have friends like Remley. And Phil says, I'll show you what a nice guy he is. And he gets tells Remley that he's progressively more ill to see how if Remley would pay attention to him and take care of him and be kind and considerate and loving. And it builds until Remley comes to the door one day, now you're in the last scene, and knocks on the door, and Alice opens the, the door in tears, and Remley says, Hi, Alice, and she cries, and Remley says, What's the matter? And Alice says, Oh, Phil, uh, uh, Frankie, it's terrible. Phil is dead. And there's a long pause, and Remley says, Alice, will you marry me? <laughs> well, you know, if you want to know about friendship, 
<laughs> you can imagine the uh, laugh. That's the, wonderful. The worst thing. And we were sitting in the in the in the hall one day, and I said to Jack Denny, "I know this is funny material, and I know Alice and Phil and I are doing it well, but the laughs are so much more explosive. They are so much bigger than." than I expect. What are they laughing at? Hmm. And Jack said, you and Phil say and do, under whatever the circumstance of the story is, all of the things that people really would like to say and do if they had the nerve. And that's, that's the laughter. That's what you're hearing. But we would get those kind of laughs. You know, we'd put poor Tedley in the oven once. And... Did you actually do that? No, no. I, I mean, how did you get... How did you... I, I've always been kind of curious to to wonder how how an audience that sees all these things visually on stage reacts to a, a gag like that. Well, they see Tetley standing there holding a script in front of his mouth, so he sounds like he's inside an oven. And they see a big metal thing that the sound man is pounding on, and they they go along with it. They they know what the picture is, and they're not seeing what they're seeing really. They're seeing what the story tells them that they're seeing. Uh -huh. And they enjoy it tremendously. We used to have, in the live radio days, you did everything in front of an audience. And those theaters were packed by people who thoroughly enjoyed sitting there and watching uh, half a dozen actors standing in front of microphones reading off the script. You know. Hmm. Well, of course, it works in the theater, too, if, if you have a reading. I'm thinking, I suddenly got a picture in my mind of going to see Don Juan in Hell, and Lawton, and uh, Aggie, and uh, who else was in there? Boye. Mm. Reading uh, off of lecterns. And it was magic, mm. you know, because the words were so powerful. You're listening to the Old Time Radio Show on 71K News Talk Radio. Now back to Denver's Old Time Radio History buff, John Dunning. We are back with about 23 minutes left and not nearly enough time for me to ask all the questions I want to ask. But um, I wanted, one of the questions I particularly wanted to ask you, um, I'm talking to Elliot Lewis again from um, uh, Los Angeles. Uh, yeah, when you play a part like Frankie Grimley, I, I listen to um, some of your portrayals on suspense, and you, you, you go from in, within one week playing... Uh, a real psychotic, psychopathic character to playing Frankie Remley. How, how do you do that? I mean, that's. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking. I think of of a of a real loser you played on a show with Judy Garland. You remember the show Drive In? Oh yeah. Um, where you take her out on the the, the hills overlooking the city and uh, yes. and uh, try to kill her with a she knife. She falls in love with the guy, doesn't she? Isn't that the story? I think you fall off the cliff to your death in the end. Yeah, no, I mean, in the story, it seemed to me it was the the basic plot line of that. Well, I think the way it works is she's a car hop. Yeah. And uh, you've just come from killing somebody. I, I, she, I hold her hostage, don't you? Yeah, you, she, she sees the blood in the car or something yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. Who no. was that? Do you remember? I sure don't. I'd have to, I'd have to go back and listen to the credits, but... Yeah. But, uh, you know, you don't get much farther from uh, Frankie Rimley than, than a show like that. Well, I remember a Sunday. Remember John Nesbitt's Passing Parade? Oh, sure. Well, we used to do the Benny show from that studio on Melrose that I described from 4 to 4.30 to the east. And Nesbitt's Passing Parade was at CBS, which is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 and a half blocks away from 4.30 to 5. I was on both shows one week. It never occurred to me that my car wouldn't start, that, mm. it might not have, that I might have an accident, that I, in one script, had a, had a part where I was playing the mully, and I was going to drive during closing commercial, system cue, and opening commercial on the Nesbitt show to CBS to walk in and play Dr. Semmelweis, the man who discovered and cured childbed fever. Hmm. Never occurred to me that there was a problem, that there might be a problem, that it was impossible. When you're young, 
and stupid, you can do almost anything. <laughs> you know, it, something is only dangerous and and uh, foolhardy and could be difficult if you have the brains to know it. If you don't know it, you just go ahead and do it. So I suppose uh, even when I was doing Ramley, I was doing Ramley. You do Ramley and. When I picked up the script on suspense to work with Judy, then I'm playing that kind of a guy. You know? I'm sure once you get the character of Remley established, and it becomes almost like a, a part of your, 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 I don't want to say Remley is a part of your personality, but... Uh, no, I guess it is, though, You're, you know, because I'm not doing anything magical, or didn't think I was when I was doing it. I was just playing that kind of a guy who didn't particularly care, you know. But even in those early shows, the earliest of the Phil Harris shows, if you listen back to them today, uh, Remley is totally consistent throughout that run. I mean, there didn't seem to be a time, at least to the, to the casual listener, mm -hmm. when you were breaking that character in. I don't think we ever did. I think it, it was one of those lucky, uh, fortuitous accidents. I picked up the first script and played it the way I thought it would be funny and the way it would work with Phil without too much effort. And uh, it worked, the people laughed, and, and the rest of it goes to, to uh, Singer and Chevrolet for writing that thing every week, you know. They kept the character and they keep the consistency then of, of the relationships and the humor and everything else. One of the things uh, also that I've noticed is that, um, listening back to the Zero Hours, you uh, you had Ann Whitfield on one of them? Yeah. And you used uh, scripts by uh, Shirley Gordon, which were, which, who was one of your, I, I would call, major writers on uh, on stage. Right. Uh, you, you must have kept in contact with a lot of these folks from, the, from oh, those yeah. days. Still, uh, well, not Ann. I called Ann. I haven't really seen any of those people. We see Shirley quite often. We see Ejack. We see Mort Fine. Uh, Hi, Aberback. I worked with Fletcher Markle on the last two shows. We see Fletcher and Dee Dee. Uh, so the contacts are kept. We all worked very closely together in those days. And as in any working relationship, in any business that you're in, when you've worked with people for 10 or 15 or 20 years, you you, you spend a lot of time with them, you know. Mm -hmm. You know what they can do. Exactly. And, you, and you're you're especially comfortable working with them. Uh, the radio business, the entertainment business, uh, the writing business is a high-risk business. High risk in the sense that that uh, you're always working with your neck stuck out. And so as many people who are sympathetic to that as you can find uh, <laughs> is who you surround yourself with. Well, I can say amen to that. You know, well, of course. Mm -hmm. You know, you're you're sitting there on the air, live, and uh, you don't know what I'm going to say next, but you're hoping. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, when? How did you get into directing? Well, I had kind of when I started on the Silver Theater show as an actor that I was talking about, the first Young and Rubicum Network show on CBS on Sunday afternoons. I got on it, uh, Glenn Hall Taylor was the producer and director, and True Boardman was the head writer on the show. And the first show starred uh, Jimmy Stewart and Russell and Russell. And they needed somebody who could say in tempo with a music score and a phonograph sound effects record, who could say, you better go back, you better go back, you better go back, you better go back, and do it in tempo and keep doing it. And True and Glenn Hall asked me if I could do it. They knew me from the, the soap uh, opera that I was doing for the agency, and I could, so I, I uh, got the job. And I went over to do uh, the Silver Theater. Now I've rambled, so I forgot your question. Um, yeah, I was going to I was gonna ask you, too, if you kept in contact with Glenn Hall Taylor. Yeah, I see Glenn Hall every once in a while over at the Pacific Pioneer luncheons every yeah. now and then. He was on the show. Oh, Glenn. We, we had him about two months ago. Yeah, um, yeah uh, I asked you how you got into directing, and, and oh, uh, that was leading. Yeah, that was, so on that, those shows, I asked the men, because I always found acting boring. 
because there's not enough to do. You do it, and then you're finished, and now what are you going to do, you know? They would go back to the office to do rewrites and changes and all that kind of stuff. So I would go into the booth and listen when I wasn't on in the scene, and then I'd go back to the office, and they'd let me sit there with them when they were doing rewrites and cuts. I was just a kid. And uh, so I got interested in all of it. And when I started working on suspense, uh, Spear asked me, because I was writing suspense in addition to acting on it, I wrote some of them, and I edited a great many of them. And Spear had to go away and he asked me if I wanted to direct it. And I said, yeah, sure. So I directed one, and then the CBS people wanted to do Broadway's My Beat, which had been on in the East. They wanted to move it out here, and they needed a producer-director. And Mort and Dave, uh, Mort Fine, David Friedkin were going to write it. And uh, we cooked up the idea of scoring it with a jazz orchestra and got Sandy Courage for that. And I all of a sudden was directing a show every week. And from that I started directing, uh, I did my own series on stage, and I directed Crime Classics, and I was directing Suspense and Pursuit, and... Uh, finally wasn't acting at all anymore except on on stage and doing Remley. Every I didn't have time. Hmm. Uh, was it your idea originally to bring uh, top flight comedians in to do dramatic roles on suspense? I don't know if it was my idea. I thought it was a, a good idea. I didn't see any reason not to do it. Uh, I remember we had one script. I was standing in, in uh, in the bank one day before they have the lines they have now where a single line spreads to all of the windows when you went to the bank to cash a check or do your business you selected a window and you stood in that line and it always it seemed to me this one day because i was in a hurry to get back to my office that everybody in my line had a bag full of business to do with the bank or teller and every other line was moving quickly so I went back to the office and I thought, gee, that'd be a funny thing that happened to Jack Benny. Hmm. And we did a script where it does happen to him. And uh, uh, who wrote that? I think Henry. Anyhow, I, I remember the showroom. Yeah. The, what He doesn't know is that he, the, the bag that he thinks contains money has a note in it saying, this is a stick up, give me all your money. Right. And the crooks are driving around the block ready to pick him up, and he's standing in a line that's not moving. You know. So it was a good, funny suspense show, but it's good suspense, but it had to be done by a comic. Hmm. We got the script, and the sponsor called when we were in rehearsal and said, we won't let you do it because it's, it's not a suspense show, and it's not funny, and it's just terrible. So I said, well, we have to do it because Mr. Benny's here, and he likes it. And we did it, and it was enormously successful. Sponsors are always wrong. <laughs> well, it's not that they're wrong as much as if I'm sponsored by, let's say, the electric auto light company, I am not going to tell them how to make spark plugs because I don't think I'm qualified. But for some reason, everybody in the world thinks that they know how to act, how to read scripts, how to write, how to, write, mm. how to direct, how to produce. Uh, how to play musical instruments, how to sing operas, any of those things, how to paint a picture. And they don't. And all that you would hope for is that they would have the grace to acknowledge uh, that there are people who know how to do it and that they would have some respect for it. Who have uh, learned how to do it through uh, a very, very painful learning process. <laughs> it doesn't come easy. No. How many pages a day do you do? Uh, <laughs> sometimes five. Yeah, I'm but a... that's seven days a week. I mean, you know, you. you uh... I know. I know. Well, uh, it sounded like a flip comment when I said sponsors are always wrong, but that's what I mean. I mean, no, uh, whenever a sponsor sense because they think they know because uh, they are the sponsor and therefore they think they are in control and therefore they think they know and they're going to tell you how to do it. And, of course, that's exactly the wrong thing to be doing. There are many television shows today that reflect that. 
they look like they were put together by people who have absolutely no business sticking their noses into something they don't know anything about. They wouldn't do it in anything else. You wouldn't go in when the plumber was fixing your pipes and say, step away from there, sir, and I'll do it. <laughs> so why do you go in and, and, and say, no, this scene won't work? You know, well, there was somebody a... that doesn't know how to read a, a script is uh, calling on the telephone to say a scene won't play. Well, that's insanity. A person like that should be locked away in an <laughs> institution. There was a there was an anecdote on Gunsmoke where uh, uh, this, the agency man was sitting up in the booth or something, and there was a, there was a line in the script that said uh, where Matt Dillon was supposed to have said, uh, "Well, we're lucky that didn't happen," and he and he just went through the roof. He said, "Well, you can't have the word lucky on a show that's sponsored by Chesterfield," Correct. and uh, that's the kind of thing we're talking about where where agencies and sponsors and and so forth just really should butt out and not. Not be involved in We that. had one like that when I was producing the Lucy show at a Christmas show. Agency man is sitting there at the dress rehearsal. End of the Christmas show, a group of child singers arrive at the door to sing a carol. And Lucy opens the door and says, Oh, come in. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Lovely closing. And they go, Joy to the world. And the agency man went right through the roof because that was a competing product. Mm. Joy. Incredible. You know. So it, it, it's, uh, you're dealing with, with what we used to call the League of Frightened Men. Mm. All the people that are afraid to have opinions or, or have judgments or allow anybody else to have them for fear of rocking the boat. Well, that's a devastating uh, series of words, the League of Frightened Men. <laughs> yeah, well, that's what we always used to call them. You know, I used to have a, a cup on my desk that, that I kept pencils in. And I had painted on it a famous Fred Allen line, which is, where were you when the page was blank? And I would turn the cup around when somebody came in five minutes before airtime with 17 pages of notes about how they would have done it, you know? Yeah. I think we all know editors like that. Oh, yes. Well, I know them very well. I've got five minutes, and I'm, I'm, I would be totally uh, remiss, at least to myself, if I didn't ask you about On Stage, which is one of my absolutely favorite shows, and I'm not just saying that because you're here. Um, there, you, you, you did some wonderful stuff on that show, and it, it just seemed to come along too late, didn't it? Well, I, uh, it occurred to me years later how many shows we did and what kind of writing we had and the kind of chances that we took and uh, I still can't believe we did it. I suppose if I were given the opportunity I'd do the same thing again. It seems to me that that's the kind of, if you're going to do an anthology, which that was, that's the kind of anthology to do. You do a little bit of everything. You take all kinds of chances. I remember, uh, uh, remember the one we did called Conrad in Quest of His Youth? I, I don't, I've never heard that one. Marvelous, marvelous novel that was written, I don't know, 1907 or 1908. I'm not in, in the room with the book, so I, I can't just turn around and find it for you. Anyway, Ejac did an adaptation of one section of it. There was a magnificent show. Fred Steiner did music for it. Just lovely, lovely love story. Uh, all the things. Ejac wrote, I don't know, what, a dozen fantastic original stories. Shirley Gordon did such good stuff. She did a thing called Call Me a Cab. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah. She did a lot of good stuff. Shirley's been writing uh, children's books, you know. Really? Yeah, I think she's written seven children's books. That's a pretty good field to get into if you want to be a writer. Yeah, it sure is. I think they're uh, for Harper and Row. You might look around and see if you got, they have them up there in Denver. Incidentally, I have to say, while we're on the air, how much Mary Jane and I love that area of the country. Denver? Yeah, we had a vacation there uh, once again, I don't know how long ago, but the way we took our vacation was we flew to Albuquerque, took uh, rented a car and drove up to Santa Fe and Taos. Then we drove up to Boulder. 
We stayed in Boulder, and we stayed in Estes. Mm -hmm. And we spent a day in Denver, and we wandered. It was around this time of the year, as a matter of fact. We wandered around Rocky Mountain National Park. Just absolutely loved it. Well, I hope you'll come back sometime. and would uh, love to come back. We'd yeah. love to. I'll get on the train. Lo I'd love to meet you and talk to you. Yeah, it'll be fun. Um, I have just a couple more questions here that I want to ask you before we, we self-destruct here on the radio. Right. Um, did you keep do you do you keep your own shows? Do you have any copies of them there? No, I don't want. Them. Do you do you want them, or you don't you don't care particularly about having them, or what? I I would put them in a box and never play them, John. Uh, it makes me very uncomfortable to hear my own voice, and you may have this with your writing. I have it with mine. Everything that I have ever written, when I go back, I want to change it. Oh, absolutely. I can't understand why I allowed it to go out in that form. And so, uh, I, I don't have anything. Somebody sent me something the other day. No, they were going to. Bud Tolleston, who did sound effects, was making, on uh, Sears of Mutual, was making copies for June Havoc of some old 16-inch uh, acetate she had from radio shows she'd done and he said Bud called me and he said you show up in two of these a uh, Philip Mark Mars Playhouse and a Suspense I think it was and he said so I'm making you two cassettes and and uh, I didn't want to say <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to do with them it was very sweet of him you know mm -hmm. but uh I don't think that's an unusual attitude. I think, you know, you talk about writing. I think Jim Bishop uh, had a column in a couple of years ago in which he said, you know, I've written 25 or so books, and they're sitting there on a on a on the piano between two bookends. And he says, I never go back and look at them because I know without a question that I could do them better the second time. That's a very oh, uncomfortable feeling. Absolutely, and I feel the same way. Well, you know what it is with your books. So I feel that way with books, and I sure feel that way when when I hear myself. I can't believe it. You know, that anybody really paid that man for, for talking that way it seems absolutely ridiculous. We had a question from a listener about the re record album that you and Kathy put out about anniversaries. Happy Anniversary was the first one, and Happy Holidays was the second one. We did them with Ray Noble. I wrote them and directed them. They were released by Columbia. I completely forgot about them. They were never really pushed or sent out or anything else. Never made a nickel on either one of them. And a man like you on a CBS station in St. Louis called me on the telephone one day to do an on-the-air interview, as we are doing now. And he said, of course, you're very famous in St. Louis because of the album. I thought he was talking about Manhattan Tower. And I started to say, oh, you mean Gordon? And I got about to the G in Gordon Jenkins' name, and he said, happy anniversary and happy holiday. Mm -hmm. And I said, I didn't know you could get them. He said, we have them on the station here, and we play them every year. I've got some uh, taped copies of them, but to, to answer that listener's uh, question, uh, if it hasn't already been, they are not available anymore. We haven't I haven't done for a while. To the kind listeners, I suggest that everybody in St. Louis, if they enjoy the albums, write to CBS Records and see if they still have the master. Maybe they want to put it out again. I don't know how those There's an idea. Work. There's an idea. Listen. Yeah. Elliot Lewis, I appreciate you coming on more than I can say. It's been a delightful hour and uh, ten minutes, whatever we've done here. I haven't begun to ask you all the questions that I want to ask you sometime. I hope I can get you back sometime. Anytime, John. To do another another show. And I, and I would also like to talk to your wife, Mary Jane Croft, who was a, a well-known radio actress and uh, for many years. Heavens, yes. All right, we'll get back with you, and thanks again. All right, fine, John. Thank you. Okay, take care.